Well, welcome to another edition of Fire and Training. I'm your host, Douglas Klein. Joining me today to continue our conversations about resort fires and the considerations and tactics and operations at these is my good friend and colleague, Christopher Nam. Welcome on board, Chris. Hey, Chief. Good to be back again, Doug. You know, I'm really excited about this topic, and and we've talked even more offline about uh, some of the tactical considerations, you know, some of the challenges that we're going to run into at these places. And we've actually had great feedback from our audience talking about how important this is to them, and it's actually bringing things out that they didn't think about uh, when we began our conversations and we talked about being secluded in the mountains, those type of places, some of the challenges, especially, uh, that they run into that they didn't think about, uh, that they probably just never had an, you know, a fire that actually presented themselves or an EMS call or, you know, some other sort of call that they had. So, you know, this is, this is the good part about this conversation and dialogue that we're having is that, uh, it, gives an opportunity to look at things that we don't normally think about and looking at the areas that most people don't even consider to be a resort area. So uh, I'm looking forward to this, Chris. Today we're going to dive in and talk about uh, resorts that are located on the water. We're not going to do the coastline, but we're going to talk about lakes. We're going to talk about streams. We're going to talk about some of the areas as to uh, where we know that there could be floating vessels that are like resorts on the river or even on lakes. So um, I'm ready to get cranked up and have a good conversation and, and go like we've always done. So let, let's take a look at this, Chris. You know, across the United States, um, no matter where you go, there are resorts on lakes. And most people don't take into consideration the RV world at all for resorts. They think about a resort of being a large brick and mortar structure that exists, but there are so many resorts across the United States, you know, from coast to coast, border to border, north to south, east and west, that are on lakes, that are on, you know, water areas along rivers that are RV resorts. So let's take a look at that. Give me some of your thoughts on it, Chris. Well, you know, Doug, you know, we coming on the heels of our previous discussion talking about mountainous and remote types of conditions when we talk about waterways we talk about accessibility and naturally there is quite a bit of accessibility via the waterway but at the same time there may be some limitations based upon where that resort may be so there's a couple of things that we will get into our into our conversation here in this particular episode and then the other thing that you just talked about is the variation in the types of resorts. And again, the, the, the larger, when we think of a resort, one normally thinks about a large property with a footprint and a number of different buildings, primary, ancillary, and so forth. But in reality, there's far greater uh, the number of resort facilities in which individuals do come via either their, <clears throat> excuse me, either their RVs, their campers, or pop-ups, however large or small and inclusive of even uh, tenting and, and camping types of conditions. So there's quite a variation. But with that being said, the thing that um, impacts the emergency service side are going to be what is it that the individuals, the, the public at large is going to be doing there, and especially when we talk about some of the crafts and some of the um, um, vehicles that support that, meaning the the boats that either go up and down the rivers or those that are docked. There's going to be mobile and those semi-permanent types of structures. So there's a lot of things here that really tie back into everything that is so unique about this particular series and, and what you've envisioned. There is so much to it beyond the surface. And as we start talking about these individual challenges and risks, as well as the geographical locations, we are starting to identify even more and more potential opportunities for pre-incident uh, planning, preparation, identifying levels of risk, and more importantly, operational uh, perspectives, depending upon the organization, their composition, and, and where these facilities are. So I think the first thing our listeners need to start thinking about as they start listening to this episode is, hey, what kind of small or large uh, resorts or, or complexes do I have? 
up in the backwoods, up on the river, down near the bank, somewhere in the mutual aid response area, somewhere geographically, either in the first two or in mutual aid areas. And chances are, and I know for a fact, again, even in up our region up here in the in the upper uh, northeast, there's such a vast number that when you start really looking at them, large and small, the larger ones I think are, are more uh, of the lesser degree, but there's a significant number of these smaller types of entities, all with a varying degree of risks. Well, and, and I know that we've had several instances to where we've had responses to uh, these RV resorts. And even though I'm on the coastline, uh, inside these RV resorts are, are waters, bodies of waters and lakes. But, you know, one of the things I want folks to keep in mind is anytime you go to a resort, you've got amenities that are there. So uh, one of the things that when I think about tactical responses and some of the considerations is with uh, the, the types of hazmat that you have. And a lot of people, and I was having this conversation the other day, and they said, wow, we never even thought about hazmat. Well, you've got all your pool chemicals. You've got your chlorines that are there. Uh, what happens when, you know, you get some sort of a chlorine leak, which we've had that recently, and uh, we've dealt with that. As, I mean, it's a full-fledged hazardous materials response. You've got an opportunity to have a lot of people that are sick because most of the time these pool facilities are very, very crowded. Um, we also have a lot of LP gas that are in these facilities. Uh, here recently, we had an explosion in an RV with, with LP gas, and we had damage to like four sides of, of what occurred. I mean, it just basically flattened a large um, RV. And, and when, I, when I think about this, an RV could mean a lot of things. It, it wasn't a camper. It was a motorized motorhome. There was a very large motor, motor home that, you know, when it exploded, you had damage on both sides and in, in the front and the back to, to other vehicles. But again, think about uh, the size of some of the tanks that people are using or even that exist at these facilities that they constantly are filling these 20 pound cylinders or 40 pound cylinders or now that you got double cylinders. There's, there's a lot of things that go into that as well that you have to take in consideration. And if you get, you know, an explosion that damages something, you know, beside of you or around you, then you potentially could have more of a leak, which could trigger a secondary explosion. And these are just things people don't think about when it comes to like an RV facility that, that's there. The other part of it is that um, people don't take into consideration is some of our RV resorts that are out there are extremely, extremely large. And some of them have permanent housing in them as well as transient housing or, or RV components that exist. Plus, when you throw that in there, what's one of the pieces of infrastructure you have to have for a facility like that? And that is some type of sewer or, or processing whether it goes into a municipal system or whether they have their own system depending on where you're at that also adds another round of chemicals and one of those chemicals specifically is hydrogen peroxide and its concentration is extremely high and it's it's really dangerous and i mean it requires a true level a suit to be able to operate in that so you know chris when we're sitting here thinking about it how many people do you think really become analytical to this point about just what actually exists around them that they don't consider to be a resort. I think far greater than uh, than we're discussing, and I think far greater than than the conversation entails. I mean, stop and think, you know, th this conversation really began last year when you did your first program at FDIC or this past year, but the conversation commencing last year. And we've, and you and I have had some conversations on some of our other programs, just talking about the uniqueness of resort complexes as a building and occupancy type and risk and some associated issues uh, dealing with our buildings and construction and, and tactics and operations. But overall, I think the facilities are, are taken for granted because we just don't, meaning the fire emergency services doesn't think enough about it because there is no shopping list. There is no uh, specific uh, rules of engagements or, or textbooks and so forth 
And that is, I think, what is so important about having this conversation. And the manner in which we are addressing these things, they are specific to the variety of things that one might encounter. And again, depending upon the size of the jurisdiction, they very well may have from from seaside to intercoastal to the waterway areas within a pretty sizable geographical square mileage. So um, these conditions either may be very, very unique, uh, very, very specific, or they are so part of the day-to-day landscape that they blend into the background and they're taken for granted. You know, you talked about the hazmat portion of it. I'll just interject this is that the one thing, especially with the reactivity to certain types of products and chemicals and materials, the one thing we have a tremendous degree of is water in these vicinities. And in many instances, the water's reactivity to certain types of products can really exponentially uh, increase the level of severity, the risk, the exposures. And because of the geographical presence uh, of these locations, there may be very challenging issues dealing with the migration of any type of uh, plumes and vapor clouds, evacuations, and we're, we're in condensed, uh, depressed areas. I mean, there's just so many different pieces to all of this that I think are, are really worthy of the conversation that uh, our emergency responders need to take a look at. But I go back to my comment uh, at the beginning of, of our conversation is that there are far more smaller size semi-resorts and again, meaning, and again, I, I don't know if we've quantified them. We've we had a little conversation a while back talking about similarities with uh, our classifications of what we did with our our mansion type or large area residentials. Everything from a certain type of category to these mega complexes, and uh, actually, even just recently, just in the last couple of days, I remember seeing something online with another significant uh, resort area that's being planned uh, in the Midwest, if I'm not mistaken. So there's a lot of stuff going on, and these are of interest, both from corporations and trying to bring in uniqueness in areas or building out existing resorts and facilities and making them larger to start drawing in the crowds as we continue to move past the COVID uh, period and so forth. You know, another component to this, we, we talked about being on water, and you mentioned it is the limited access that you have. Uh, it does change the dynamics of how well you can get to certain areas or certain points that, that do exist. So, you know, that is a, a piece that you have to take into consideration. Also, uh, I know in some of the campgrounds that I see, air, some areas you have a lot of access. It's easy to get in. It's easy to get out. We can manipulate our apparatus. We, we could do the things we need to do. I know in other areas that I've been in and in campgrounds that I've been in is that uh, it, it's fairly tight and it's not wide roading. And, you know, you don't have a lot of what I would say uh, mobility with fire apparatus, especially when, you, when you're running in larger um, apparatus such as tenders that are running in to, to be able to supply you water or depending on the size of your engines. And and even in some of these areas, because they have ancillary buildings that are associated to the resort, the need for a, a, a ladder truck or an elevated master stream device to be able to get in there, it, it takes a lot more to get around. And some of these resorts have been around for a number of years. Apparatus have changed significantly in that time period and they've not really been upgraded. So that brings me to another topic to talk about is the location they are. One of your challenges not only is being able to access them, but what type of infrastructure do they have for a water system such as hydrants? I know that many of these are located in rural areas. Uh, If they do have some type of a system that's associated to the on-site facilities or water that exists there, like ponds and lakes, it would be a dry hydrant that would require you to draft out of, which is another engine to be able to supply you a a system versus a municipal water system that's under pressure, such as a hydrant, uh, or you're, you're running in, you know, water supply apparatus of tenders to be able to get to that point and provide you with the water you need. And people are saying, well, how much water do you need for an RV? Well, you figure you line 
25 or 30 of these up, depending on where you're at and what type of, you know, atmospheric conditions you get with wind and, and heat. If you're in the Midwest and say in Arizona or some of those places, you do get some pretty good strong winds, high heat. Um, you know, you, it could be a challenge. You could actually lose four, five, six, ten of these in a row oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to be on fire by the time you get in there just simply because of, you know, the dynamics of what fire does with these type of, of establishments or vessels that they were actually using. So that's another challenge. That's another consideration that you have to take in place. And at this point in time, it's, you know, what type of tactics do you deploy? Uh, in some cases, you're going to be going in a defensive posture to try to stop the the progression. In other words, you know, the way that used to be, you try to keep it to the room of origin, to the floor of origin, to the building of origin, and then, a.k.a., let's keep it to the block. Let's don't burn anything down past the block. And in, in reality, that could occur at some of these resorts. And we, we see that here in our uh, campgrounds and our facilities that, you know, have permanent style residencies or fixed structures, not, you know, movable structures that exist. And you, you think about it, today's world, especially during the COVID time period, these boomed significantly. And there were a lot of these that popped up and a lot of cabins that were added and, you know, campers are just robust in, in what people are doing today. So some challenges there tactically by far. Well, you know, I think the uh, the increase in density levels that uh, that we are experiencing. So, properties that had a a pretty decent layout of the past, and as things started migrating and changing, those lots were available, especially with the uh, transient types of RVs and camping and so forth, uh, became more condensed. So there was a what I'm seeing is a, an increase in the density level of the number of um, plots and lots available and pads and a diminishing amount of space that used to be dedicated to fire breaks. In other words, should something propagate and extend through a particular lot area consuming numerous particular uh, plots and lots and uh, uh, pad areas, the natural breaks by the distances of the separation of the roads was always in, in place. But I think by virtue of just economics and revenue streams and ch the changing models that in facilities where they are adapting and redesigning, we're seeing these density levels increase. We're seeing reductions in the size of natural fire breaks and fire separations by roads and other conditions, which are creating more hazards. So the likelihood for fire extension and propagation and more serious types of events occurring within those property areas is more likely. You guys have seen it, certainly in your area, and I think it's it's uh, it's pretty much a given based upon what, if you historically look at some things over the last number of years with some high profile events, they're, they're pretty, they're becoming more common, in other words, and, and very well may, may become more common going forward. So uh, another way to look at um, what we're talking about of uh, being on rivers or being on lakes is as these lakes have begun to populate and to grow and the resorts have you know moved to things like that to attract people it's an economic development component uh i think about some of the lakes that i've been to uh smith mountain lake in virginia is one of them i've seen uh douglas lake out in tennessee uh, there's several lakes down in florida that you know i've had the opportunity to to be around or be at and they're they're building big buildings, resorts, and resort facilities right on the lake. And again, you know, just like in the mountains, you're very restricted on some of your accesses that we talked about uh, in the very beginning. I've talked about this in, in most every component of, of this you will find is there's something that restricts you of getting access to, no matter what it is in a resort, there, there is restricted ac access to it. But one of the things I, I do want to throw out, Chris, that really jumps out to me about lakes is how, how do you get, if they build it right at the lake or right on the edge or even somewhat of an overhang for the design aesthetics that they're trying to get, how do you begin fighting fire when you're over water or when you're trying to work off of decks or, 
you know, that's a challenge. And that's where we actually have to begin looking and, and jurisdictions need to begin looking at alternative fire apparatus for actually being able to suppress fires at these locations, but not only just fires, but what other types of, you know, events could occur here that are emergencies that you're going to be responding to. Uh, we, we've thrown hazmat out there, but what about high angle? What about water rescue now that starts coming into these that are challenges at resorts? You know, initially when we, we started this program or when it began, uh, Chief Halton, you know, when we were having that conversation sitting at the Double Tree in Myrtle Beach, uh, was wrapped around fire. But as we did this in, in FDIC last year, there was so much more that began coming out of it from the students. And as we've continued these conversations, the feedback that we're getting from students is there's so much more they respond to than just a fire related incident. And it's like the emergencies that they go to of how do you gain access to some of this stuff? You know, the medical responses that they're going to that are associated to resorts like um, a good example, we had one recently, it's, it's not at a resort, but it's at a, at, like at a park and they had, you know, these automated systems to where it actually pulls you around a cable and, and you're doing some type of, you know, uh, boarding instead of like skiing, it's, it's, you know, you're on a ski board and one of the guys actually fell. Well, they ended up with a significant, you know, spinal injury. So these are responses that you got to go to at these resorts that you're dealing with. They've thrown water parks in there. Uh, even in the resorts, you're talking about the pools. One of the things that uh, recently popped up on the news was a response in, in our area that is at the water. It was at the beach. But you think about having the same facility on a lake. you got a nice pool. you got a nice lazy river. One of the, the kids goes and pulls a grate off that's actually the water return that cycles it. You know, all of a sudden you've, you've got a change in dynamics of what that water's doing and, and it can actually vacuum them down into that or trap them and it's a drowning machine. So we're not just running fires, we're running EMS calls, we're running technical rescue calls, especially if they're building these resorts or they're doing some type of maintenance. We're running uh, some type of water sport type rescue call. Uh, we do have fires. And the, in some of these places, you know, when you start building it, depending on the size as to whether the codes are going to require you to have fire suppression systems in them. So, you know, that's a whole nother ball game we've not even talked about associated to these specific style of resorts that are on the water. Um, not to mention that they're building these now that have boat accesses underneath them to where you store your boat. In other words, you pull up in and it's an undercover, basically boat garage. Or if we look at it, it's, you know, like some of our uh, buildings we talk about, you know, that, that are built, that parking is underneath the building. Well, it yeah. is, it's a watercraft parking and we're seeing that more and more across the United States that's occurring. You know, instead of having, uh, you know, uh, either a concrete deck or a, uh, uh, well, typically a con some type of a concrete decking for the understructure, you know, we've got water. And uh, that does create a, a number of different issues dealing with the uh, the movement, the uh, the travel of both personnel, the vehicles, uh, the hazardous conditions based upon the types of flammable and combustibles, ventilation issues and so forth. Let's go back a little bit to the building. I think of the, the siting of our buildings especially when we talk about waterway and uh, lakefront property. Normally, there's two different uh, trainers of thought. Typically, buildings are going to be footprinted and laid out a, a distance away from the shoreline to take advantage of that shoreline area, typically with beaches and, and other amenities, whether they be wharfs, docking conditions, uh, or other docking or pier facilities. So there's a couple of different aspects there based upon the natural uh, resources of that uh, particular location. The second part is where they uh, expand through expansion or by primary design, start building those as close to the, the water line to take advantage of various types of architectural or aesthetic uh, vistas and the views and so forth. And then we start going into the overhang and in areas to, again, allow a more robust experience. I mean, again, you think about sunsets, uh, 
you know, the, uh, the types of things that are part of that natural area. Then the third element of that is where it takes into account both the siting of our buildings on the shoreline and then the ancillary or temporary facilities that are now part of that resort and complex that are on the water. And that's something that I think that we're seeing more of where we have these both temporary docked or semi-permanent structures that sometimes are very large vessels or barges that are equipped to provide additional space, whether it be for a wedding or some other type of activity or seating for a restaurant on the water and so forth. So, and then that those lead to the fourth piece that we've talked a little bit about, and those are the vessels that come and go and utilize the, either the lake and or the river area for other excursions, whether they be day trips, whether they be overnighters, or whether they be extended activities that take a sizable population from the resort onto the waterway, go somewhere for some cycle or period of time, and then come back and go back to the facility. So there's some other pieces here that I think that when we look at, um, especially the number of river-based cruises that are increasing, again, they have a particular home port, meaning the resort, and then they're off for an excursion of anything from a, a one day or multiple days. And that is a, and where we're seeing that more and more because, again, it's, it's just latching on to the economics where you can take a trip, go up a river, see a lot of different things versus taking a cruise out onto the ocean and into some type of an exotic area. There's, there's a lot of different things. And I think many of our listeners can start saying, yeah, we're seeing more and more of those. I've seen the advertisements. If you're monitoring those from a, uh, from a travel standpoint, uh, there are certainly a, a, a lot of those occurring in our region to entice individuals to go throughout, whether it be to the Southeast or to, especially in the Midwest, the, the entire uh, Mississippi basin, that entire river system uh, continues to be a primary area in which these new types of ventures that very well may challenge local uh, resources with these types of activities that may, may not have been to the point where they are now or where may, they may be going in the near future, in the years ahead. You know, one of the places that come to mind when you're talking about that, Chris, is Alaska. And going up in, you know, the areas like from Ketchikan, leaving out of there, going up, you know, and it, it's actually the ocean, so to speak, but it's inland waterways that are associated to that of, of being in these areas. And there's large, large cruise ships. And, and I mean, that's another challenge that comes, you know, not only into your ports that are there, but that are out on the water that all of a sudden, you, you know, depending on your jurisdiction, you may be responding out to. I know that we do this quite frequently um, on the waterway. Uh, they go out the intercoastal waterway to the ocean with the casino boats. Uh, what well, that's not necessarily quote unquote a resort that people would be staying at, but you have a large number of people that are on there that, uh, you know, you, it's, you're it's a floating that. resort. I mean, it goes yeah, back to classifications, you know, it goes back to yeah. we, we can identify these types of, of ventures and activities and so forth. And if we can categorize them based upon occupancy, sizing, cycling, and be able to identify the levels of risk, guess what? There's some strategy, tactics, pre-fire planning, all the way from the the 50, you know, uh, the 50 occupancy type boats, all the way up to maybe the the 150, 200 occupancy types of river vessels that have overnighters and so forth. So I think those are more common. And what we're seeing is, especially in certain regions around the United States, that the smaller size vessels uh, that are a resort um, on the water that are going from their port, wherever their primary resorts are, to some of the locations, or stopping. Again, here's the other thing is that you have these vessels that stop in designated areas um, as they are going through their cruise itinerary. And guess what? They may be docked in a particular marina unbeknownst to the local fire department, and suddenly you have a, uh, a 50 or 100 occupancy vessel that is in this particular marina, 
that you are not expecting to find that number of individuals, whether it be mass casualty, other significant conditions, fire conditions, versus having a large uh, you know, cabin boat that would typically have five, six, eight, or maybe 10 people mo- maximum with a boat fire or other emergency. So these are game changers and you need to know these routes and, and where they may be docking, what size marinas, what's the frequency, what's the schedule and so forth. So, you know, it, it started off back in the day years ago when, especially in the Mississippi and some of the other river areas where, and, and again, it's not just the Mississippi, but where river boats and especially with, with various types of, um, uh, gambling uh, activities, that really was the, the big, I think, push. Uh, actually, going back maybe 40 years ago, we saw some things in various locales. I remember going to uh, FDID, FDIC in Cincinnati and going across the river and going to some of the docked river boats that had extensive facilities and dining and so forth. And you certainly didn't feel like you were on a semi uh permanent structure it was actually that riverboat and the you know the population density and the activities that were going on and and, and so forth uh, created some interesting perspectives back in the day and probably even more so today so although we've got codes and regulations i think there's still a lot more to all of this than than what commanding officers senior officials emergency planners law enforcement, rescue, tech rescue, special ops. I mean, all of the uh, support agencies that are involved, there's a lot of stuff going on here that these unique circumstances and conditions in those resorts uh, uh, play out. And one of the things that I think about with a resort always come other things. And you mentioned the restaurants, you mentioned some shops. And of course, they start building the deckings that go out over the water. You got walkways. But it's also all the infrastructure that goes underneath those to include natural gas or LP gas, most likely natural gas that is going to supply restaurants and cooking and, and doing those type of things that that's a game changer. And all of a sudden now you you're over, you know, 10, 15 foot, 20 foot out in the water or further, you know, maybe more than that. And you've got, you know, a fire, you got you know, fire underneath the building, trying to get to it is is very difficult. It's a whole different challenge. One of the things that uh, we ran into not not long ago in in working with a mutual aid partner was they had a fire. It's on a deck. The building is actually out over the water. And I remember dealing with this, and this is something that came up, you know, many years ago from you know, where I've I've lived in the past of having to deal with these type of facilities. And one of the ways that you actually can combat fire underneath there very easily, because it's sometimes hard to get, you know, any type of boat up to these because of, you know, the draft of the boat, the access, you know, because of walkways, things like that, is you gain access down through the decking, but you put in a floating pump. Uh, a portable pump and on that you know where it discharges you can actually put an angle and a nozzle that turns up and you actually push or control that underneath there with uh, uh, some type of either rope lines or pipe poles or or some type of tool that will help you actually manipulate and and hit fire that may be underneath i mean it's just like a house and you, well, you probably, well yeah you probably, <laughs> I mean, well, it goes back to having the right tools, right? I mean, having the right tools, the right equipment. We talk about dock and wharf conditions. We talk about marina-based uh, firefighting, shipboard firefighting. There's a lot more to it, whether it be large or small. And both the training and the equipment uh, may not match up. The degree of manpower and the technical expertise and the competencies and skill sets may not be up to par or maybe. But uh, I think the bottom line is that there, there is this need to identify what is the availability of the equipment. I think many times with uh, lake and riverfront uh, types of properties, there may be a single resource or a, I should say this, a limited number of resources that may be able to provide that support, whether it be fireboats. And again, we talk about small scale types of vessels that have some type of pumping capacity, but the question will be, is it enough to be able to make a difference in the mitigation and control of those events? 
chances are there's not going to be enough of them, nor will there be enough of the capacity to provide that type of waterfront support. So, and we see it time and time again, large uh, lake areas, and there may be one particular department that can support the uh, purchase and the maintain uh, maintenance of a particular dedicated firefighting vessel. But again, now we talk about travel distances, now, and then we talk about the, the need for multiple types of conditions. Time and time again, I think our listeners can think about this. You, We've seen photographs of that single vessel that's out on the lake pumping away and literally the complex uh, burning itself down to, to the ground because we've got traditional firefighting forces on the, on the uh, building side, and then you have limited resources trying to uh, attack those challenging conditions due to accessibility, proximity, design, aesthetics, uh, architectural features, all those other elements um, on the water side. And there's a, a major disconnect. The, the disconnect becomes the challenge and difficulty of fighting fires in situations from the water side. And that goes without saying, you've got to be on a vessel, you've got to have pumping capabilities. It's not like you can throw a ladder from that side. So there's, there's a major change, right? There's a major change in how we tactically approach those buildings coupled with height factors, changes in depth, current. You know, we talk about uh, current conditions that, you know, that, that are gonna play out in terms of different seasonal aspects, whether it be spring, uh, summer, or in the fall time frame, and, and so forth. So a lot of different moving parts here, but uh, they are all part of identifying, you know, again, what, what do you have in your backyard and uh, what, are the, what are the gaps First, no, it shouldn't even be that. What are the things that you're doing good? What are the, the potential gaps? And where, and where can you uh, identify the opportunity to close those gaps? And I think these conversations are, are part of that. You know, and as we're talking about water, anytime there's water, especially if you're talking about uh, waterways or rivers, even lakes, there's the other side of the fence that you get is flooding. And those, that's a whole nother dynamic of operations, especially when you start putting moving water into the equation, especially if it's a, a large body or a swift, you know, current that, that you're dealing with. That's a whole nother ball game that you have to take into consideration. So as, as we're talking about all these things, I hope our listeners that are that are tuned in and that are paying attention are, are beginning to think, oh, wow. You know, geez, we've got this here. We, we've got this resort over here. You know, I never thought about this. And that gets them started in the pre-planning. It gets them started into the, the thought process of what do we need to do next? What type of training do we need? Do we have the right equipment? Approaching the right people to maybe get that equipment. Those type of processes need to start resonating in people. And the problem of it is, and I, and I think, and I go back to what I said in the very beginning, Chris, is most people always tell me, oh, we don't have a resort area around us. And then I start naming some things off and they're like, well, I never looked at it like that. Well, it is a resort area and there's, there's unique challenges that go with each type of place you go from coast to coast, north to south, east to west, border to border, it doesn't matter. We've got these type of resorts that exist across the entire United States, branching this out. It's all over the world that we have these type of facilities and resorts that exist that our listeners need to be thinking about. Well, you mentioned, uh, you know, you talked about the drought or the, uh, the aspects of flooding. You know, let's, let's talk about the drought. So within the last uh, three or four years, we saw significant resort properties throughout the United States in certain geographical regions, uh, having significant uh, depletion of those natural resources on the rivers or the lakes, whether they be artificial lakes through the damming systems or, or other tributaries that led into them, but water lines significantly dropped, which again creates an entirely different dynamic. So the availability and accessibility of water, which was part of the risk planning, uh, is no longer present. We see the lack of facility usage, but there's still going to be a risk factor associated with those buildings in either a vacant or semi-occupied uh, condition and state. 
Now, we've also seen the replenishment of those particular bodies of water and, and things change. But again, the dramatics of looking at water lines that have dropped 30, 40 or more feet from where they normally would be traditionally to that point during the worst stages of the drought, those also create. So seasonal impacts, climate change, however and whatever you want to call it, but they are all part of looking at some bigger pictures, which again, I think that we've neglected to look at that big picture. I'm certain, again, when we've talked to some of our colleagues in those locations, there were a lot of challenges and they weren't certainly never would have envisioned a lake dropping down to that level or in some instances, the, the water line depleting completely and the dry beds that suddenly occurred and those things have gone back and again are being replenished, but just based upon the cycles that we're going to. But things change, things change very, very dramatically. And we, we need to be cognizant, as you mentioned, of those transient individuals that might be seasonal in a particular time of month or a seasonal standpoint, what that population and occupancy loads are going to be, but also not to neglect those that are part of the staff that could very well be living on that property during those seasons. What is that occupancy load coupled with the transient of the visitors and how that, again, is adjusted increases and decreases both in the buildings, the resorts, and those conditions based upon the activities that are going on. And I think also one of the things that comes to my mind is I think about some of these lakes that uh, their pool levels are changed dramatically between summer and winter time. And part of them are like the Tennessee Valley Authority that uh, mm -hmm. you know did that for flooding. They changed the level. So, you know, in the wintertime, we, we see some of these lakes that are significantly lower, but you still have people going to resorts. Uh, just as you talked about the droughts, this is a, a man-made drought, so to speak. And it changes the dynamics that are around on these waters, you know, in, in different times of the year. Um, and, you know, another piece that sticks out to me, and, and I think about Lake Tahoe is the one of the ones that come to mind that, uh, you know, I got a good friend of mine that goes, you know, back and forth out there and actually works in the summertime, uh, you know, with with some of the stuff on the lake, you know, as far as the resorts and, and rentals and things like that for, you know, the beach accesses. But, you know, think about, you know, in that resort type area, now you throw in the differences of the weather uh, that fall to that, you know, the inclement weather of snow, the inclement weather of ice. Uh, depending on where you would actually go in the United States, the potential for lots of rain, uh, road accesses. You know, again, it's an accessibility of being a remote resort that we talked about. But now we, we you know, take that to another complexity level of adding a lake and water and all those access problems. Well, water wants to go where it wants to go. So when we talk about flooding in particular, um, and we saw it in Bucks County down in, in the areas just outside of Philadelphia just in the last couple of weeks, significant torrential rain conditions and, and how they affect uh, immediate flooding, the accessibility, the rapid changes and the rapid risk and certainly the impacts on rescue response. So seasonal issues, uh, again, we've been talking more so about the summer months or those conditions in which a lot of outside activities occurring during good weather, but a lot of resorts who make use of 24 seven through a seasonal standpoint, 365, you know, those lakes do freeze up in those geographical locations. And now we get into snowboarding, snowmobiling, ice fishing, um, uh, snowshoeing, various types of other activities that are winter based that in themselves create an entirely different set of parameters. Now, again, snow issues, the, the amount of uh, snowfall that may occur, icing conditions and so forth, as well as temperature, hypothermia. I mean, so we talk about heat conditions uh, during the summer. We talk about hypothermic conditions during the winter, accessibility, uh, having the snow cats uh, and snowmobiles versus having the ATVs um, and the all-terrain vehicles that you would be using in the summer, boats versus uh, the snowmobiles. So there's just, again, layers upon layers here that one has to consider in those activities and, and what the other activities may be. You know, do we have tow ropes? Do we have various types of ski lifts and, and other activities that are suddenly seasonal based that change that resort from one type of risk, one type of hazard 
and other challenges from a suppression, special ops, rescue, EMS, and so forth, based upon the seasonal elements. And I think that too, it used to be some of these resorts were very seasonally based. In other words, they had their season, whether it be just in the winter or just in the summer. And I think we're seeing, again, based upon the economics and the marketing models for viability is that more resort and facilities, large and small, the mom and pops, all the way up to the large corporate entities are looking at models that create an entire year round experience. And that too is something that local responders need to be aware of what's in the planning stages, what has changed. Hey, by the way, you know, we suddenly recognize that this coming winter season, they're gonna be offering X, Y, Z types of things. That needs to be on the forefront to plan ahead and, and take a look at what that implication is going to be for uh, the locals. And, you know, we haven't spent a lot of time on fire, but um, honestly, you know, fire conditions can occur the, at any of these. We've talked about a lot of things, but again, it, it's a pre-planning aspect of what you're going to have to be able to do, what your accesses are, what, what your fire flows What's your capabilities, manpower specific for capabilities? Um, what What's your equipment capabilities? We, we've kind of touched on this all the way through. Um, you know, Chris, we, we've been going for fi- basically about 50 minutes now, just nonstop of hammering some things back and forth. And honestly, we could probably go for another hour or better just with conversation, which it's always great to, to be at the kitchen table. And, and have these type of talks, you know, with with what we're we're really experiencing in the world today, and what's really some of the challenges that we got specific to this topic, and it's it's resort, you know, operations and tactical considerations, not only for fire, but for every you know emergency we go to, because when they don't know who to call, they're going to call the fire department, they're yeah. going to dispatch the fire department. We're yeah the hazard mitigation emergency response unit that goes to everything. And, you know, that's something that we have to prepare for as well. So as, as we come to the close of the show, Chris, what's some of your final uh, thought, thoughts on as we part out of here to, to our next adventure when we meet again? Well, again, I, I think that, as you mentioned, Doug, there, there's certainly not going to be any, uh, limitation on what we can talk about in these topical areas as we as we continue the conversation going forward and in the future episodes. I think the takeaway here when we talk about uh, the uh, the natural resources of, of rivers and waterway based um, resort areas is uh, the aspect of accessibility and that is the biggest thing. Accessibility may be uh, very prompt and very very much a positive or accessibility may be significant challenges that are seasonal or facility physical based. And I think the other part of that is to recognize there is going to be the the types of activities that are shore based and the types of activities that are going to be water based. And those are very distinctive and very separate, although they're unified based upon what that facility is offering doing. I think emergency responders need to recognize the uniqueness of each type of condition and that the facility or that building per se may be water-based either in a transient, semi-permanent permanent, or is going to be a floating vessel that comes and goes as well as the resort building that it might be attached to. So a lot of good takeaways I think in our conversation and that is the uniqueness of as part of it. Something that may be very, very huge in nature but I think more and overall, we're looking at some very manageable kinds of conditions out there, but you got to be thinking, you know, some critical thinking, pre-fire planning, and, and think about what may be coming up, communicating with those organizations to find out what they're currently doing, what they're planning, and just have a pulse for what's happening. And, and that's going to be a, a good big takeaway for everybody. And I hope everybody's really taking that in because the pulse is the key. Um, this is not unique to one geographic location. This is not unique to just metro departments or large city departments. You know, what we're talking about in this series exists from the largest of departments to the smallest, ruralest departments 
across the United States, and they all present the same challenges uh, that we have, I mean, that we've discussed. And the biggest thing that you have to look at in, in my thought process to this, and this is one of the realizations that, you know, a listener brought out to me and, you know, actually I had a, a good conversation with was like, you know, you open my eyes, you know, we're a small department, but we have big city problems with these resorts that we have around us that we never thought of. We always took it for granted because nothing had ever happened. Yeah, that's the key right there. Russian roulette. Yeah. So yeah, the frequency and the risk factors, I mean, that goes right back to it all. And and that's why this is such an important conversation conversation to have. Well, Chris, I certainly appreciate you joining me again for, for our conversation on fire and training. Uh, fire and training is dedicated to the men and women who are in the streets 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, taking care of business and making sure that we've given them the, the best education we can, the best information, the best insights so that they have that to work with, so that everyone does go home. Uh, to the next time we meet, Chris, thank you again for joining in. We'll be back uh, on the next fire and training talking again about some resort fires, and we'll be taking it to a different location, a different concept, and talking about tactical considerations and operations and things that we need to be doing on these resorts, not only from a fire perspective, but from a, a global perspective of our emergency responses. Till then, stay safe, train hard, and we'll see you on another edition of Fire and Training.